Welcome to everyone who's watching our presentation. I'm Ignacio Montoya and my two co-presenters are Julian Bolton and Macario Mendoza Carrillo. Uh, we are all either currently or were previously affiliated with the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, which is where the project we are discussing is based. UNR is located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Numa and Washu people. And Macario and I uh, also currently reside and work in that territory. Uh, we will be talking about the about how Numa language classes at the University of Nevada Reno have created a decolonial space within a colonial context, namely a university setting. Our presentation today will focus on Numa or the Northern Paiute language. Numa is an indigenous language spoken in the Great Basin that expands from California, Nevada, Idaho, and Oregon. Numa is part of the uto aztecan language family, more specifically the Numic branch. This language family expands from the northwestern part of the U.S. all the way down to Central America. Numa has many dialects or bands. One that stands out is the McDermott band that is shown here in the blue circle. This, this one, this is one of the only places where they have first language child learners of Numa. However, our project today is based on the Pyramid Lake dialect of Numa, which is used by the Kiyui Dakota people that are located 35 miles from Reno, Nevada. On the slide here, we have a picture of the pyramid, which the settlers named the lake after. The Pyramid Lake tribe as of 2017 has only a small handful of speakers, which that number is declining. That is why elders and community members say maintaining their language is of high priority. And now I'll speak a little bit about how uh, the NUMA classes came to be developed at the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, these classes came about as a result of an idea raised by Christina Thomas, a tribal member from the local community, who at the time was also a UNR student. In early 2018, she approached me and another faculty member, Janan Ferguson, about finding a way to allow students to take NUMA language classes to fulfill the university's language requirement. Uh, we then brought a proposal to the World Languages and Literatures Department for establishing these classes. And by the spring of 2019, the proposal had been accepted and we then hired the instructor. Uh, the first class launched in fall of 2019. Uh, NUMA classes consist of a four course series. And after this coming semester, in other words, at the end of spring 2021, we will have offered one full rotation of all four classes and a half of another rotation. Um, I will also note that as a result of the pandemic, uh, from the middle of spring 2020 onward, the classes have been conducted on Zoom. So in terms of who is taking these classes, um, about half of the students um, have been Native American, mostly but not exclusively from the Numa tribe. A little over a quarter have been white and a little under a quarter Latinx. Uh, the instructor of record for these classes is Ralph Burns. He's an elder from the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. He's also a native speaker of the language and um, is also renowned as a storyteller. Our goal in this presentation is to analyze particular features of these classes using principles of decolonization and language reclamation as a lens for understanding the ways in which these classes are different from other classes in a university context. We are broadly defining decolonization as the undoing of the effects of colonialism, uh, which involves in part recognizing and valuing of indigenous knowledge, needs, and priorities. Language reclamation can be thought of as decolonization and is applied to language revitalization. When people often speak of language revitalization, implicit in that idea is a primary focus on increasing numbers of fluent speakers. In contrast, work under the umbrella of language reclamation is grounded in and driven by community needs and values. Now it may and often is the case uh, that this includes the goal of increasing numbers of speakers, but language reclamation speaks to a much broader conceptualization of language work. 
Our focus uh, today will be on specific components of the NUMMA classes themselves, um, but it should be noted that the very existence of these classes is in and of itself a decolonial act. This is because in varied ways, the classes disrupt ideas and institutions of colonialism. For one, the fact that NUMMA classes exist in the course catalog alongside languages such as Spanish and French signals that indigenous languages have just as much legitimacy as other languages. In addition, as a result of the publicity surrounding these classes, they have served to raise awareness among the broader community of the existence of the language and the people, uh, which is particularly important since there are people in this area uh, that don't really know anything about the local indigenous communities. In addition, these classes uh, serve as a space for indigenous students, uh, especially NUMA students, uh, to see their culture represented on campus. And importantly, the fact that a NUMA elder is the instructor and has autonomy with regard to how the class is taught, this is a way of recognizing the expertise of a member of the community. Uh, the focus of the rest of our presentation is about how particular aspects of the classes themselves create a decolonial context within the classroom environment. So I just want to note that I'm currently on coastal Chumash land. For this study, we adopted a tripartite methodology consisting of interviews, participant observation, and conversations with the instructor, Ralph Burns. The first piece of our research methodology was participant observation. From the very beginning of these classes, back in the fall of 2019, all three of us were in the physical, or at least virtual, once the pandemic started, classroom space ourselves. This helped with the interview aspect of the methodology because students were being interviewed by their peers, i.e. other members of this newfound community of UNR NIMA speakers. Which brings me to the second piece of our methodology, the interviews. We recruited students from Paiute 111 and 112, the first batch of UNR learners, and the interviews were fairly informal. They were more like slightly structured conversations, if anything, with some key basic questions such as, why did you take this class? How has this class been different from other language classes you've taken? And do you have any future plans for the language? These interviews were conducted over the summer of 2020. So due to the pandemic had to be conducted over Zoom. We also gathered information from conversations with the instructor, Ralph Burns, who shared important insights regarding student learning, his own pedagogies and teaching philosophies and so on. Now we're going to talk about some themes that emerged in order to answer our question, what features of the classes made them decolonial? The first theme we'll discuss is the recognition and valuing of differences. Um, so it's really important to note that not all of the Paiute folks in the classes were Pyramid Lake. And Ralph would start the semester by saying that just because your grandma speaks differently than mine doesn't mean that anybody's is wrong or speaks better. And he would reiterate that sentiment throughout the term as well as talk about the different dialects of Numa. And he did make a habit of asking people how their folks would say certain words. A second point is respecting varying levels of fluency. There are people who'd been around the language their entire lives, people who are completely new to the language and people who fell somewhere in between. The knowledge and abilities of everyone were respected. And this point especially speaks to the language reclamation framework. Recognizing and valuing these different levels of fluency breaks down colonial ideas of who is a good speaker. A common anxiety that speakers of many communities, not just this one, have is not speaking correctly or sounding right. One of the interviewees mentioned not wanting to sound like a gringo. So Ralph's affirmations were really important in this way, something that's sometimes overlooked when teaching languages, and especially by linguists who maybe aren't as concerned with reclamation, is encouraging speakers and increasing their confidence with the language. The third subpoint of this theme is recognizing and valuing different motivations for taking this class in the first place. Generally speaking, native NIMA students took these classes because they wanted to connect with their indigenous identity and culture. This was extended to their families as several students practice the language with their family members who've been speaking for years and or who are currently learning themselves. Additionally, these classes connected native students with other resources and speakers who they may not have known about or had access to otherwise. As for the non-native students, they had motivations of their own beyond, I needed language courses to graduate. A main reason for taking the class was to learn more about indigenous culture more broadly and NIMA culture more specifically. 
This motivation was guided by recognition of whose land they're occupying and a desire to understand those people. One student mentioned how they felt they had a duty to learn the language of the people whose land they occupied, and additionally wanting to be more knowledgeable and responsible about teaching Native American topics in their own courses. And then on a lighter level, it's just exciting for them. Non-Native students were also just really excited to take the first ever NIMA classes to be offered at UNR. They recognized how important these classes are and wanted to be a part of that. One way in which this class is different from others is the way in which storytelling and oral histories are incorporated to give firsthand experience with the language. Our instructor used the same creation stories that he once had used to learn the language himself. By passing down these stories, he's passing down knowledge of cultural tradition, morals, and geography that help identif identify the environment that surrounds us and the changes that have happened since. Storytelling is also used to help students practice speaking the language. Students are asked to memorize these stories and recite them for a midterm or a final. Also, the idea of using oral histories to remember past events is very beneficial. Students are welcome to share family histories and contribute to the understanding of the NIMA way of life. This helps put things into perspective and gives students validation and affirmation for what they already know. Another theme that is incorporated is the incorporation of communal life Essentially, Ralph mirrors the same structures and values that he had when teaching community classes. Everybody that wants to learn is welcome. Everybody plays an important role in these classes. Often these roles become fluid where students can become the teachers by sharing unique skills, knowledge, or stories that contribute to the understanding of the NUMA language and culture. Most importantly, at times, Food is incorporated into the classroom to mirror that gathering of the community. By performing a simple act of sharing a meal, it allows, it allows students and people to start conversation, make dialogue, and practice using the language. This helps students bond and create new acquaintances that are very vital to their educational journey. All of the aforementioned themes are interrelated and speak to the fourth theme we're discussing today, the informal classroom atmosphere that's been cultivated. This atmosphere creates a sense of community among the students and supports language learning. In these NIMA classes, despite the different motivations for taking the course, the overarching goal is to just learn the language. I myself have been in language classes where the instructor pits students against each other and where people feel the need to be the best. Ralph is not like these instructors at all. As mentioned earlier, he's very encouraging. He doesn't shame students for pronouncing things incorrectly or forgetting certain words, which stems from one of his teaching philosophies, essentially that everyone is a five-year-old. You wouldn't shame a five-year-old for speaking incorrectly, hopefully, so why shame a grown person who is new to a language? Ralph also fosters a sense of community by assigning lots of group work. These cooperative tasks and activities help people work together towards a common goal of speaking the language and communicating with others. And Ralph himself is fairly informal, which contributes to the relaxed ambiance of the classroom. One interviewee mentioned that the NIMA classes feel more communal due to students making jokes and Ralph picking on people in this very familial way. And that's super important. These classes aren't just facilitating language learning, they're also faci facilitating bond creation and strengthening amongst all of these different people. So to sum up, uh, we offer a few broad conclusions. Uh, to begin with, these classes show that education can serve as a potential site of decolonization, or at least that a decolonial space can be created in a conventional educational context. And this is particularly relevant given that the educational system has served as a tool of colonization for a very long time. Another relevant observation is that this space of reclamation comes about uh, because the indigenous stakeholders are given autonomy and self-determination. The decolonial features of the class came about precisely because a Numa elder taught the classes using his own lived experiences and epistemologies as a guide. In addition, 
though we point out various examples of decolonial practice that we saw in these classes, we also note that decolonial practice takes on many varied forms, including but not limited to those uh, we presented on. Uh, and finally, we want to emphasize that this particular context, a decolonial space within a colonial setting, benefits both indigenous and non-indigenous participants. Creating spaces like this has the potential to be transformative more broadly for universities and other such colonial institutions. We'll just conclude by saying Peshamu. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And we look forward to hearing any questions that you might have for us in the Q&A session uh, later. Thank you very much.